All right. Well, the, uh, Hello, my name is Karen Daniel. Uh, the Central Press has been conducting a series of interviews that will commemorate the tornado that struck Bibb County in May the 27th of 1973. So this is just an additional interview that we're conducting today. Um, and we're doing this with Phil Cottingham. Um, in keeping with the theme of the tornado, I guess this is an opportunity for anybody who experienced it um, to, to share their th thoughts and the things that happened to them. Uh, David and I moved to Bibb County five years after the tornado, so we weren't here during that time. But during those years since we moved here, we've become good friends, strong friends with Phil and Jenny Cottingham. And so we've heard a lot of the stories, a lot of the stories. But I guess this is an opportunity for the community also to hear the stories of those who actually lived through uh, the tornado of May 27th, 1973. Phil being one of those people, I guess you were a young you man at that time. You can't be my witness, can you? Mm -mm. Uh, so, Phil, will you tell us a little bit of background about who you are and you know what your background as far as Bibb County is concerned? Well, my name's Phil Cottingham. I grew up in Brent. Uh, I actually live right next door to the house where we grew up, and it's my grandmother's and granddaddy's house. And uh, I uh, have lived in Bibb County all my life, with the exception of six years that I lived in South Alabama. But uh, I'm just an old homeboy. And most of your family, too, in and around where you now live, right? Yes, actually, uh, my son is the first Cottingham to leave Alabama. <laughs> and go west, young man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I want to kind of back up to the day itself and the, day, the way the day started. If you can think back, what do you remember about just seeing the weather that was, as it was building the morning of the 27th? That was a Sunday, right? Well, I don't remember the morning. We went to church that Sunday, and but that afternoon I was out and around town with some friends, and the weather was very unsettled. The wind blew strangely, I guess you could say, from uh, what it normally did when weather was coming. Of course, we didn't know uh, then, didn't have the, the technology and stuff to predict the weather as far ahead as they do now. but. Uh, it was very unsettled and uh, just kind of strange, but uh, it was a sunny day with lots of clouds and, and lots of wind. And uh, it was nope. that way most of the afternoon. But you hadn't experienced a tornado prior to that, especially one of the, to the degree that that one was that day, to really have a concept of what was beginning to happen. No, there'd been little tornadoes. We'd have little tornadoes, you know, and there'd be a few trees blown down or one house somewhere with a roof blown off or something, but not, not just mass destruction. So that afternoon you went on about your business as normal and decided to go on back to church that night, or did you go to church that night? Well, I was going to church. I lived in a, in a trailer over on Burnt Corn Hill, and uh, I was getting ready to go to church and I had noticed uh, back to the south I looked out the window and there was a real black cloud and it was almost time to leave and I said well I, I better go on and go now because I'll get wet you know going getting in church so uh, I locked up my trailer and got in my car and pulled out and I got to the stop sign uh, where Bear Creek Road or County Road 1 runs into Highway 25, and uh, the storm hit. And I mean, it was just uh, something I'd never experienced. My car was actually skidding sideways on the asphalt, and, it, and I was afraid it was going to turn over. The wind was blowing so hard. So I pulled out into 25 and turned with my rear end toward the wind. And uh, it wasn't, it didn't last, but just, I, I can't give you an exact time, but very short time, and everything settled down, sort of. 
Well, I was going to turn around and go back to my trailer and check on things, and there were power lines down in the road and trees and everything, and I couldn't get back that way. And I said, well, I'll go on toward Brent. And uh, it was kind of an eerie thing because the, the, the sky was still dark, and it, had, it was raining, but uh, not so hard you couldn't see what, was, what had happened. And uh, I went down Burnt Corn Hill where you cross Hayesop Creek, and there was a, a family on the left at a house there that was coming out, you know, the house was torn up and everything. And I should have stopped, but I, I had in mind my whole family and my girlfriend, wife-to-be, Jenny, were at the church. And if, uh, you know, this kind of destruction was everywhere, there's no telling what situation they were in. Came on up into Brent and uh, passed my mother and daddy's house, and I saw that it wasn't damaged very much. And my grandmother and granddaddy's house was not damaged that much, the house that I live in now. And uh, I got up as far as uh, about where the post office is in Brent, and there was a car sitting in the middle of the road with the lights on, the windshield wipers going, and there was nobody in it. And uh, uh, this is like one of those movies, you know, where everybody vanishes but you. <laughs> and uh, there was stuff all in the road, you know, there were... Uh, Old and Belcher Lumber Company also had an oil company, and there were empty 55-gallon drums just all in the road right there in front of their office. And uh, I had to, I pushed some of them out of the way with a car. And uh, I drove on up to about, well, close to the railroad track. I didn't cross the railroad track, and I just couldn't go any further in the car. So I just pulled over and got out and went to toward the church. And uh, when I got to where I could see the church, it just looked like, you know, where a bulldozer had gone through the church. And my heart just dropped because I knew my whole family was at that church. And uh, got up there and it was just chaos, you know. And got in, went, went around to the back and, and found my mother and uh, Jenny. They were together. Uh, and they were okay, but there was people that were, were hurt. And uh, just like I said, it was just chaos. And I found out that, that Daddy was okay. And uh, I was pretty much, you know, up to that point, that's pretty much what I experienced to then. Was Steve there too? Was he at the... Steve was at church. He had been at church. And he had left, he was a senior uh, that year in high school, and they were having the, I don't know whether it was a baccalaureate service or something, and he was gone, left church to go to Centerville to get his girlfriend, Carrie Lynn, who's now his wife, to bring her back to church. And uh, he was in the car. Uh, well, he's probably already told you that. Over so there. he was north of the just, just site, north and of you the were church. south of the site, yeah. both coming the same direction. Yes. Yeah. Well, your Aunt Ann had spoke the other day. She was on a recording as well, and she said that she was sitting outside in her car. So were there several people that might have been out in their cars? I, I'm not sure about that. I, I don't know of any personally. There was a lots of damage to the cars. Uh, there was, I remember one car, it was Miss uh, Faye Dottle's car, that a two before, was driven through the fender of it just like you drive a nail in a bowl. Yeah. And uh, the, the debris, the, the sticks and limbs and insulation out of houses and all that kind of stuff, it broke all the windows out of the cars and all that stuff was inside the cars. And uh, I, don't, I don't remember specifically anybody else that was in a car at the church. Now, I think there was some different ones uh, up toward the Dairy Queen up that way that maybe were in cars, but I, I don't know their story. And people were trapped inside the church in the basement areas where they were trapped? They weren't trapped. They had gone from 
up in the sanctuary, downstairs to be in the basement. You know, they realized the weather was getting bad, but it was too late. They, they waited too long, and some of the people that were still in the sanctuary, that's where one man got killed, and uh, several others were injured real well. How did, what, did something fall on him that yeah. caused his death? Yeah. And Miss Faye's uh, injury was caused upstairs or downstairs? I'm not sure exactly where she was. I, uh, it wasn't, I don't think it was downstairs. I don't think she had gotten downstairs, but she had a piece of concrete that went through her thigh, just like a piece of shrapnel or something, you know, and just went through through her leg. And I, I remember seeing it when they were at the hospital, and uh, it was an awful wound, and she eventually lost her leg because of it. Yeah, and you've told a story of transporting her down to Perry County. I think Steve went in detail on that this morning. Uh, I don't know if you could add to that or not, but I know you had told us in the past that that was the only way y'all could go to get help was to head toward Perry County. Is that correct? Yes, uh, and, and actually it was Steve that transported Miss Fay. I had uh, uh, Miss Pauline Hunt and Mr. John Oden. Miss Pauline was in very bad shape. She had a bad cut from a piece of glass on her leg, and uh, she was bleeding bad. And uh, Mr. Oden had had some injuries, but not not life threatening. But uh, we didn't know at the time. The only way we knew to go was south. And uh, if had we known otherwise, there was. There was a way you could have gone just a short distance and things were open, we could have gone to Tuscaloosa. But there was no communication or anything. We didn't know how far in that direction the storm had done damage because it seemed like where we were that it was just the whole world was messed up. But uh, in, the, in the meantime, in the interim, I guess you would say, between me getting to the church and then us carrying people to the hospital, we went down to the lumber company, Old Belcher Lumber Company, and looked for machinery to uh, clear the road out because you couldn't, you couldn't drive any further than I had driven to begin with. And uh, we got a forklift and uh, a front-end loader and just push debris out of the roads, you know, you just push till you couldn't push anymore and push it to the side and then back up and go at it again to clear the road out to the church where we could pick up, you know, get people and leave with them. And uh, it was it was sort of strange. Uh, Barbara Roy Elam was a county commissioner at that time, and he had gone to the county shop and got the front end loader and I had a, a forklift from the sawmill, and we almost collided with each other in the middle of Brent down there trying to clean up stuff, but it was just a... Uh, Were y'all not worried about hot lines with the power company? Well, you know, at that time... Uh, you just didn't think. You just didn't... Wasn't, wasn't thinking real good, probably, but, uh, you know, everything was down so much, it was pretty much certain that the lines were dead. Uh, Somebody made a comment about worrying about us running over bodies or something, but, you know, uh, I, I don't even remember thinking about that. But huh. thankfully, there were no bodies. So do you think the people in Perry County were alerted that you guys were bringing hurt people down? Were they ready for y'all? I mean, a, ho a small hospital like that. There wasn't any communication. You know, there were no cell phones. There was no landlines at that time. You know, we just, uh, I, I remember when we got to Perry County to the hospital, uh, somebody had mentioned that they had heard on the radio or, or TV or something that there had been a tornado in Brent. And uh, that was the only... So maybe they were somewhat prepared. They were... Well, I don't know that they were prepared, but... Uh, they knew, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't like today when you call Druid yeah. City and say, we're bringing uh, some bad hurt people to the emergency room. You couldn't do that back then. Hmm. Yeah, 50 years ago was 
<laughs> we were all significantly younger, weren't we? <laughs> uh, and the days following the tornado, because I think Steve had said that he had, he'd gone off to college then in the fall, but you were still here in town at that time, right? Yeah. So in the days that followed, how long would you say it, it took and just how much manpower did it take to get y'all back up and operating as a CD? Gosh, I don't know. Uh, I know it was it was a it was a couple of years before some of the businesses got back up and going. You know, like the grocery stores and the drug store and uh, things like that. They got the service station. Brent service station was sort of the gathering point for people there, and uh, especially the young guys in Brent. Where did and, the Brent service station at the Y or where no, was that? No. no uh, Right there by the bank. Oh, okay. Uh, and they got it up. You know, as soon as they got power back, uh, that was the thing. There was no power. And uh, I don't remember. It's, it's, uh, it's been so long. I don't remember how long uh, before they got the power back on right there. But I remember thinking, you know, there were no trees. Everything was just gone. And the power company came in and put up poles in a hurry, you know, to get things done. And some of them were crooked and leaning and things. And somebody made the comment that uh, didn't look too good, those crooked poles. <laughs> and they were corrected that we were glad to have poles, period. Yeah, crooked or not. Yeah. So, and you mentioned, I think you mentioned the Holyfield. So was Wayne's daddy the one that had that grocery store at that time? Yeah, and Wayne worked with him there. Okay. So, and who else was along that way? Was it a Meg's drugstore there on that same strip? Well, see, everything was out on the highway, on the main street. It wasn't back like it is now. Okay, so that's not the grocery store that was here. No, none of, none of, the, none of the building. There's only one building there in the, the, what you would call downtown Brent that, ex, that exists now that was Which not, one is that? That's the one... Uh, it was Ward Tractor Company, and then it's been a feed store and several different things, but uh, it was right beside the railroad track when the railroad track was there. It's on the corner where you turn to go down toward the prison. I think Don and, Miles had that at one time. Little feed no, he store. had a building further, further oh, okay. down the street. Uh, but it was right there by the railroad. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, there was Hunt, it was actually a Hunt drug store that uh, Dr. John Meg's daddy operated and the reason it was Hunt because he took it over from his father-in-law Mr. Hunt. After the tornado he changed the name to Brent Drug and there was uh, the Ward Mercantile which sold hardware and clothing and the grocery store. Uh, I'm not sure what they called it. At one time it was owned by the Wards too but I think uh, the Holyfields had bought them out the grocery store. But they were all connected right there. <clears throat> and then there was, further down south, there was Lee Croy Furniture Company and the Post Office and Daily Fawcett Motor Company. That's where I worked. And uh, across the street was Brent Mercantile. And uh, there was a, a, a West End Grocery, Bib Supply, James Hardware, James Hardware was where the uh, wing place or fried yeah. chicken place is right there. That's where James Hardware was. And it was actually in the old original Brent Bank building. And Bib Supply was joined on to it going down the street there. So none of those remained except that one building you mentioned. The rest of them were all... Well, the, the Lee, Croy, Lee Croy building and the post office do. I said they weren't, but mm. uh, they weren't damaged as much as the stuff down, you know, in the red mm -hmm. main business area. Well, y'all had showed some pictures, uh, David and Mike and Steve had showed some pictures that you've got laid out here. But one of these in particular, I think, is your trailer. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I uh, when I finally got to go back to my trailer that night, uh, I realized that it was gone. 
pretty much. It was turned upside down. The, the walls and roof and everything blew off of it and uh, turned the floor upside down it. so the wheels were sticking up. That one right there? Yeah. And I think these are all going to be printed in that, in that what y'all are doing. What number is on that? 16J. Okay. That's not much to that trailer. <laughs> not much at all. No, and uh, the the blank, the quilt that was on my bed stayed in a tree somewhere there. I guess it's that tree right there until it just rotted out of the tree. You, did, you couldn't get it down. I mean, <laughs> It was the least of your worries at the time, right? It, uh, Do you still have that quilt? <laughs> no, it, like I said, it stayed up there <laughs> until it rotted it away. Out. Uh, it, uh, there were some strange stories at that trailer park. There was a trailer uh, right where you turn in off of, of uh, Bear Creek Road that uh, Rudy Hayes lived in. You might know Rudy Hutton. Remember Rudy Hayes, Mike? No, I don't think so. Was that trailer park there then? Prentice trailer park? Yeah. And uh, they got behind the couch to protect herself from the storm. They were in the trailer. And he said they pulled the couch out, got down behind the couch, and he said they felt the trailer go off of the blocks. And he said then right behind them, the wall separated from the floor and they slid out on the ground. Oh my gosh. And the rest of it blew away and they weren't hurt. <laughs> That's amazing. Now there were five people, is that right, Mike? There was five people all together that were killed? Five died, yeah. Yeah. Where were the, I know one was in the church. Where were the others at? Mr. Tom Green was one. He was uh, at his house? He was at his house uh, over behind where my mother and daddy lived, but uh, there are some houses just beyond the Brent Project, uh, and he lived there. And uh, he was the old guy that was the last blacksmith in Brent. Oh, really? And what? What? Another thing that uh, strange mentioning him. Uh, I knew some guys from Perry County that's last name was Green, but I just didn't put together the. Uh, connection that he was related they were related to him and that night about midnight we were down in Brent doing something down in town and I ran up on uh, one of those guys from Perry County and he asked me he said have you you heard anything about uh, about his he didn't say granddaddy he, he called him by name and I said yes he he died I said we were at Marion Hospital and somebody else brought him in, and he died while they were getting him out of the car. I said, I, you know, and there I had told the guy that his granddaddy died just standing in the middle of the brim in kind of a cold way, you know, but I didn't know. Didn't that, have a clue who he was. Who he was. <clears throat> and uh, always felt bad about that. Have you seen him since then? Oh, yes, and I pretty much mention it every time <laughs> I see him. <laughs> Because I did, I was, I, I, I was, I, I'm sorry that I said it like I did. Well, I'm sure these interviews, along with all that they're doing to commemorate, I hesitate, you can't say celebrate, commemorate the, the day of the storm, uh, is bringing back memories, I guess, to a lot of people. Um, it's got to. It's got it stirs thoughts that you hadn't thought about before. Can you remember people that you've had conversations with in the years since that brought something to mind that you didn't know at the time and you think, you know, I had no idea you lived through that and what it was like for them? Well, uh, no, not really. Uh, most of the people that I've had contact with, you know, we talked shortly after things happened and I'm, I'm sorry I, I didn't I think one, sit I, down and jar my memory about <laughs> that but I I think why I bring that up is one thing that I that David and I were aware of with Mr. Dale Black and being in church with him there and he, if I'm not mistaken he had just taken on the position at the weather station which had uh, hadn't been built long before this happened had it no and um uh, he had become here, I guess he was a meteorologist, 
and he was actually at the weather station. And so he had some interesting stories to tell. I wish he was still here to, for more reasons than one, I wish he was still around. Yeah, but he, he could, I'm sure, share what actually happened out there on that hilltop. Uh, from what I understand, they lost track of the tornado right before it hit the weather station. Uh, mm -hmm. and it was low under the radar. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've heard him talk about it, but I, I don't know specific details. And, and I so also have heard James Spann in some of his uh, testimonial times talk about him being a young teenager and how impressed it was. It, well, the impression it made on him is what took him on into the field of his career has been. I think for his he whole came. Life. I think he came with some uh, people to do some clean up work or or something. He he was he came very shortly after the tornado. Uh, I never never met him. Never crossed paths with him at that time, but I've heard him talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was a day that shook everybody. David and I were living in Silicaga at the time, and you know, as tornadoes do, when there's one, there seems to be a path of them that crosses the state, and we were not far from Childersburg, and that same day, there was damage done in the Childersburg area, and I remember us riding up to Wilsonville and Childersburg area and seeing that damage there, but it wasn't all just Brent. There was a path across the state that day that, oh, yeah, that left damage everywhere. That same tornado, I think, was the same one that went through Wilsonville and uh, uh, Childersburg and up that way. Uh, it seemed like it hop-skipped across mm -hmm. the, the state. It was kind of strange uh, how it, it was almost like it would hit something and and it would jar, it would, it would slow it down for just a moment because just like Mike's granddaddy lived right there down from the church, and uh, it destroyed the house on either side of him. And I don't know how much damage it did, but it didn't destroy the house. It was fixable. And, uh, you know, in, in other places like that, it would hit something. And then it was almost like, you know, it had to build up force again to get to the next thing. My dad said that he was out in front of the church uh, when it was coming. And they didn't, didn't, didn't even know it was coming, you know. It, and he said he looked up in the sky, and uh, you know how you see paper or something blow up in the sky with a what we call a whirlwind? And he saw something up there, and he got to looking at it, and he said it was a piece of roofing tin. <laughs> you know, a long piece of roofing tin just blowing up, just floating around in the air. And he said about that time, the, the storm got to Olin Belcher Lumber Company down there and said it sounded like uh, somebody was running a bush hog through a brick pile. Mm -hmm. But at that time, then, he, he grabbed some little kid. He, at that time, he didn't even know who it was and carried him in the church. And they got under the back pew, which was under the balcony. And uh, he... Uh, he said the little boy, when it was all over, the little boy scrambled away and ran off and said, <laughs> I found out later who it was. It was Shane Horton, but uh, it, uh, he, Daddy, that Daddy didn't know who he was at the time. So there were people at both ends of that church, which it just took a path right through the middle, but there were people surviving at both ends. Well, so the part that you see right here that's still standing with the steeple, yeah. that was all heavily steel reinforced. And uh, the other was just block walls. And uh, it didn't have the uh, exposed beams and stuff like the church has now. So really wasn't it, there wasn't much reinforcement in those walls. It uh, didn't take a lot to take it out then. No. Um, and the whole roof just picked up and sat down over to the side. Now, what's the story about Brent Pres was wiped away completely? Is that correct? What? Brent Presbyterian. Yeah. And then McDaniel Methodist, was it damaged? Oh, they may have had a little damage, but we, the Brent Baptist Church, ended up for a while meeting at the Methodist Church at eight different hours from when they had their services. Uh, the Presbyterian Church was not. They boarded it up for a while, and I think used it with the windows boarded up and stuff, but they eventually moved out on the highway. Now, 
I've heard the pillars on the front of this church, were they the ones that were used at another church when they rebuilt? Or? Yeah, but, but these white pillars yeah. are at the Methodist church, I think, now. Okay. And they changed the whole front. So all that was actually torn completely down, yeah. what was left of it. Yeah. And they started from scratch. Yeah. Okay. Um, there, what Methodist church now? Brent Methodist. Brent United at, Methodist. At McDaniel? Yeah, That's McDaniel. Mm -hmm. McDaniel mm -hmm. Methodist. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. So, you know, like you said earlier, we have so much on the news now that lets us know what's going on before and after compared to what you had back then. Um, what you hear now all the time on these news reporters that interview people about how the, the county, how the people of the city come together and support one another and help one another. Would you say that was something you were witness to in Brent at this, after the aftermath of all this? Did you see people that didn't even know was around show up to help? There would put there would be people just show up at your house, and uh, people you didn't know, and uh, offer to help clean up and yeah. do things. And uh, I remember we went the day after over to the trailer park where I lived and picked up what of my stuff I could salvage. And uh, there was a lady that was friend of mother and daddy's, uh, Miss Stamps, up at E. Olin. And she took all my clothes and washed them and uh. dried them and brought them back to me. And uh, there was just a lot of that kind of stuff went on. And there was, uh, Brent Baptist Church just got an enormous amount of donations uh, to help with the building back of the church. Uh, it was, it, brings, it brought out the good in a lot of people. Did, did, didn't it make the community a stronger community? I think so. I think so. Uh, I think er I think most everybody would take the old community back, the old way it was, but uh, it still made everybody stronger, and and uh, and there was a sense of togetherness. Uh, I have a friend I work with that recently of that tornado that we went through. What was it, a couple of years ago now that went out. Old Highway 82 oh, and out that one. But she said she lives out at Ashby and she was trying to get home that day. And she said, I promise you, everybody in Bibb County has a chainsaw in their back pocket. Because <laughs> she said, you go down the road and everybody's out with a chainsaw. So I guess that's a good thing. When you live in a small town, you tend to help each other. Maybe you do in big cities too, but I think, we kind of, I think the good in everybody comes out when there's a disaster. And... Uh, People try to help each other as much as possible. It's so funny looking at these pictures. I remember a lot of the vehicles that are in these pictures. That was a Brent police car right there. Uh, and all these co all these vehicles right here were at Daily Fawcett. That's uh, you know that what? Was new cars? Yeah, those were new cars and trucks there. Mm -hmm. The uh, you know where the concrete slab is, this side of Spiller Furniture Company? This yeah, the concrete yeah, slab. That, that was line. where this building was. Oh, okay. I don't know. Now, up there across from the trailer park where Burt Cornhill is, is there were there houses there then? All yeah, those, yeah. Those houses were there then? There were some of them. not as many as there are now, but there were a good many houses and they all had some damage, but that was that was one of the places that sort of seemed like the storm the storm picked up a little bit uh, before it dropped off the hill going toward town. There was one house uh, on Lee Croy Circle there that uh, it picked the whole roof of the house up. The curtains that were on the windows flipped outside and the roof set back down and the curtains were hanging outside over the windows. <laughs> and right there, right there close somewhere, uh, it rolled up the asphalt on the road. Just peeled it up like you open a sardine can. Well, there's a lot of weird stuff like that. Uh, yeah, you hear those stories when any town's been through a disaster like that. Uh, it's hard to believe that 50 years for this one. It really is. It's hard to believe. Well, yeah, it brings back a lot of memories, but it also uh, 
it's hard to remember some things. You know, there was so much going on that uh, it was just hard to keep track of all of it. What are we missing asking Phil? Uh, I, I don't mean to make this sound like I'm trying to compare our situation to a worse situation, but in a sense I am. It was Brent's Pearl Harbor. Mm. And, uh, you know, everything just was chaos in a sense, but everybody took responsibility and did things. And uh, it... Uh, Everything that mess. had been stable and what you were used to was totally disrupted in, in a matter of minutes. Nothing was the same. Nothing that was normal is normal anymore. Hmm. No, and, and and you still catch yourself doing it sometime, comparing things to before and after the tornado. Yeah, I've heard some people say that. It was unusual for us when we first moved here. Like I said, we've, we've not experienced anything like that. We came in 78. And one little announcement of bad weather and everybody was hunkered down. And Dave and I hadn't experienced tornadoes and it was just like, why is everybody so concerned? But after an event like that, you know, that shakes your whole foundation. Choose, well, you choose a different path at that point. One Wednesday night or Sunday night, I don't remember, we were at church after we had come back to the church and got the basement to where we could have church in it. We met at the Methodist Church, and then we met at Brent School for a while. But then we got back to uh, the basement, having church in the basement. And uh, one night, it was a night service, and it was rainy. And they had the air conditioning wasn't working, so they had the door open, and, and there was a train coming from toward Eolan up that way. And everybody in there was just like, you could hear that train, you know, and it was getting closer and closer. And uh, then all of a sudden, the whistle blew. And everybody, oh. <laughs> but there, you know, a lot of stuff like that. And it, it uh, you know, everybody went to storm shelters and everything every time a cloud came up for a long time. And it kind of gradually wore off over time, but... Uh, this last one we had a couple of years ago, I've seen more and more storm pits being built since that one even. People take it more serious than they once did, maybe. Uh, <coughs> Jenny, Jenny's parents, were at their house or were they at the Yeah, they, I think so. They, uh, Jenny's grandmother lived up uh, uh, past the Bible Methodist Church up the top of the, you know where Pee Wee Cox and Linda live? Yeah. Well, across the street in a little house on the corner there. So I got her to her grandmother's house. And they came and got her from, you know, they could come around. And I, I don't remember a lot of, I don't know, I, I, I think they were at home, but I'm not sure. What were their names? Willard and Carol Shoes. Oh, that's Willard's, her her daddy. That's his. That's, that's his my father-in-law. I'm his favorite son-in-law. He's finding out all kinds of stuff. He found out from Steve that Ann was. And he's old buddies with your mom. <laughs> yeah, I knew that, but I didn't realize that Jenny was their child. Mm -hmm. Who do you think she was? Well, I don't know. I was sitting around asking. <laughs> <laughs> you wonder what kind of strange knew. woman would marry me. I probably knew. Well, I probably knew that, but I forgot. <laughs> See, Not I, just anybody. I hey, Bill, you're talking about marrying strange people. She recently found her diary oh. that she kept oh, when we first started you dating. Know, you, Tell I, her. Y'all recording? Stop. I, I'm just. I just want. <laughs> I want my friend. What's this got to do with a Brent tornado? <laughs> Was anything? I have no idea. Tell Phil what you wrote in the diary after we had our first date. I have been culling out old stuff that I don't want my kids to have. <laughs> 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 and have burned a few things. So, but the one particular one that I saved, I have this long written information about what we did the night I met him. And then in capital letters at the bottom, I put, he's an idiot. <laughs> she married the idiot. He knew it right up front. I know. <laughs> She got doesn't say much for me, does it? When we were going through stuff down at Mama's, I found all my old report cards, and they're gone, too. <laughs> you burned them, too. That's probably a think. good thing if the report cards are gone. <laughs> oh, man. 
What would you change about Brent right now if you could go back and make it different? Put it just back, just like it was 50 years ago. That's where your you child, loved it, didn't you? But that's where your childhood memories are. I would do the same t thing to my little community, and it's not there anymore. But when your childhood memories are planted there, that's what she. Well, it just changed everything, you know. It just sort of it's it, it, it's likened to uh, taking down all the statues and historical things and stuff like that. You know, you, history's not there anymore. Except, not always progress either, is it? No, no, it's not. You have pictures, don't you, of the inside of, of the Ward Mercantile, don't you? And to me, it's awesome just to see those old stores and how they used to operate and how anything you needed, you could get there if you... We know the, the little towns were all dying, all dying anyway, but it's sort of like with Brent, it was just a... All of a sudden. And they survived a good while after that, but it's not much there now. And people, people, there were people that wanted to uh, move everything. The, um... Well, that was another thing, talking about political. When they were trying to get uh, government help and stuff, the Republican representatives and stuff and the Democrat representatives and stuff wouldn't fly on the same airplane to Washington together. Now, the the log building is Wands now. It used to be Willard's Army mm -hmm. Barn. It wasn't built then, it? No, he built it in... 78 or 9, somewhere in there? Um, later, yeah, something like that. 70, 78, 77, something like that. Mm -hmm. And the Brent Presbyterian Church wouldn't have been there because it was built after the tornado. Yeah, it, well... For somebody who didn't grow up here, though, it's kind of hard to imagine where all that stuff was. I think that's one thing David loves about the old pictures, because he can see then. Well, the Presbyterian Church like. is right where Indian Rivers is. Oh, okay, well. where uh, Dr. Conway's place was, where the mm -hmm. chiropractor office mm -hmm. was. Yeah, he had it. I guess he bought it from the Presbyterian and built his building, and then... Uh, I guess Indian River bought it from him. I don't know. What about the house that's, you know, brother? Didn't brother Bob buy that house at one time? The old was it? Has it always been right there? The old yeah. house mm -hmm. right in front of Jan and Walters. Yeah, that was a uh, Miss Maddie Murphy's house. That was uh, Thomas Elam's grandmother. And it didn't get damaged or probably damaged. Must it, it may have a little bit, but not much. Not enough to one. change anything about it. Uh, that was another thing, like I said about Mike's daddy's house. There were just there were some houses real close to a lot of the bad damage that somehow didn't get damaged. Macmillan Street didn't get a lot of damage, did it? Because mm. that's where Butch and Judy lived. Uh, I don't know if they were there then. Were they, yeah. they living there then? Yeah. Okay. Have you been in touch with Butch Huey? Yes. Is he going to come do a... Was he at Wheeler's Mountain? Like yeah. Him? Okay. Yeah. And he's written a book. I'm trying to get the chapter that he wrote about the tornado. Okay. Having a little difficulty in the format he's saved it in and our being able to open it. Oh, okay. Are you still recording? I'll see you. You owe me five hundred dollars. <laughs> I need you before you leave. Honey. You can write it off on your taxes. Are we supposed to have some kind of finale to this thing? Yeah, you, you know, know I, sum it up, sum it up. I'm sitting here looking at you. You got that hearing aid in your ear. Your brother had a hearing aid. Your dad had a hearing aid. I didn't uh, know my brother had them. He finally stepped up and got him one. I noticed that, and I'm just wondering why the the Cottingham family all have to have a hearing aid. Is it because y'all don't ever listen? No, it's because we listen too much. <laughs> oh, shit. It's coming stuff we hear. <laughs> okay, how are we supposed to wrap it he up? He hears everything. Thank you. Well, for you have coming. to sum it up. You're the closing. You have to thank this You're man. You're going to take out some of these pieces. Well, you, you have, have to thank this boy. Do we sing y'all come or anything like that, <laughs> like Jim Amazing folks? Amazing great. <laughs> how about when the roll is called up yonder? That's well, what we y'all thought. Well, we all get to heaven. <laughs> uh, well, okay. 
Uh, thanks, Phil. Appreciate you coming and doing this. Because, I mean, I, the more that the press has gotten involved in this, the more I realize that the memories that people have will all be gone if people don't record them in some way or put it down on paper or something. Because uh, I'm sure you shared all this with Justin and Allison, and they heard you tell the stories. But it, it remains in their court now to pass it on to their children unless it's written down somewhere, right? What is that you once said when I say, You'll, I'll never forget the day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Better look out. Yeah. Something's coming at I'll you. never forget, forget the, the day. day. Here comes Phil with another story. Uh, one reason I wanted to uh, interview you today is because I feel like we have a good relationship. Da Jenny and I and you and David, and we've had some fun times together, and we have listened to your stories, and I think they're pretty awesome uh, that you hang on to that part of your life. Phone. I'm sorry, I thought I had it turned off. That's his press agent. <laughs> Alexander Shinar. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Appreciate you doing this today. Thank you, and I was glad to do it. It uh you know, it uh I'm glad y'all are doing what you're doing to help preserve a little of our history. Well Phil Cottingham, I wanna say a special thank you because a long time ago when I was building a cable T V system the young lady that's interviewing you today got upset with me and quit. And said she wasn't gonna work with me no more. Today she's back here at the press helping me today because she wanted to be the one to interview you. So uh, I'm glad to have her back helping me. Well, I'm glad you let her do it. 